All right, we're just about six hours away right now from the president's first State of the Union address. He's going to be speaking to a rather divided nation, facing record low approval ratings. And while the State of the Union is traditionally the biggest speech of the year for the president, Donald Trump is anything but traditional, as you all well know. For more, I want to bring in presidential historian Doug Weed, author of the book Game of Thorns. Good to see you. Thank uh, you. Good to see and, you. And important, I think, to have this historical context around tonight. Uh, he really is a president in modern times, unlike any. Unlike any we've seen. Well, you've never had anybody <laughs> like uh, Donald Trump. But he's going to take a success lap, as everybody says tonight. And I just want to emphasize how unusual that is. Most of these State of the Unions come at a time of great crises. And it's not easy to do what he did this past year, even though he doesn't get a lot of credit because of a hostile media. But the tax reform, for example, took six years for Ronald Reagan to do. And the whole idea of turning around the Supreme Court, I worked for a president, we worked for years, our first appointment took it the other direction. So it's kind of like Willie Mays out in center field making those basket catches. It just looks so easy, but it's not easy. And jobs, it was Barack Obama's State of the Union in 2014 mm -hmm. where he emphasized how we're going to have these shovel-ready jobs. And it yeah, didn't, didn't happen. Work out so well. He had to joke about it later. But we did spend a lot of money. We spent a lot of money. So the point I'm making is, yes, he's going to take this victory lap tonight, but it is not as easy as it looks. In other words, he's gotten a lot of and it's not easy to get these things done. I believe you. Um, and, you know, look, it was touch and go with, with some of it there for a while. Now we're looking at possibly immigration reform. He's expected to highlight that tonight, Doug. Do you think he can see any kind of victory there as well? Yeah, I think that's where he's going. You know, sometimes when you get ahead on anything, losing weight, anything, sometimes when you get a head start, you get some momentum going. And uh, I th he's got to have some confidence. But the opposition, uh, the media opposition, that's something we haven't quite seen that extreme before. Really? I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But I, I'm curious from a, a bit of a historian myself, and I love U.S. history. In fact, it's what I studied in school. But from a historical perspective, when you think back to the days when they were writing a lot more than they were, say, broadcasting, um, there was also some viciousness back then. Oh, yes. But, you know, today feels, you know, and maybe it's because of the medium on television and on the Internet. It feels very different. Feels yeah, there's no like question there's a lot of venom. that there was viciousness and it was terrible, uh, but it was on both sides. The Hearst uh, Radio Network, when it took on FDR, and they were vitriolic and they were uh, very effective, but there were papers defending FDR, too. We've never had a lineup where you could actually show with metrics 96% of every dollar donated to the opposition, uh -huh. not to him. Haven't yeah. seen it quite that clear. Uh, and I no, think the Internet's right. the problem Could because be. they're exposed by the Internet. They can't hide as a journalist. We yeah. know what they think. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Doug. I'm going to see you again tonight. I'm going <laughs> to see right. all of you again tonight. Doug's going to be.